Hello and welcome back. I prepared a little example talking about how to use things such as structures to make your life a little bit easier. I've already got it all typed out because it was kind of long, so this way we can just talk about it. We've been doing things in our class using arrays. So you would have had something like this, uh, where you have a standard string name. You might give it a certain size, or say whatever. And that would give you an array of strings. And then you might have an integer array of IDs of the same size. And we did this as parallel arrays, where these two things you would store individually by name. And the index between them would be what ties them together. So index 0 is the name of the person with index 0's ID number. This is a common thing, parallel arrays. You could do the same thing with vectors, too. But we've got a new way now, new to, to us, in how do we make multiple things stick together without having to worry about logically tying them together with, uh, with indexing. And the answer to that is this structure thing called a struct. This is an introduction to what structs are. Structs are user-defined data types. You give it a name of what you want to call it, like we've got you know, your, your typical stuff, integers, doubles, strings. In this case, I called it student. Notice that when we name them, they have a capital S. That's what tells you that it's a structured user data defined type and inside there I've got a name and an ID and if you look at it if you just come down we'll pop into the functions and show you you can access the name without even having to worry about the the, 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 the multiplication versions of it so here we go so we create one we have a student that we created from the type of student this is a blueprint this is the design so when we use it we have to create one of those things so if I call load a student, which I do right here, load a student, I'm going to pass in that variable that I created, a student, into my load student and give it a name, Bob Smith. So you'll see the way you access that student or that individual piece of the puzzle is to use the name of the, the object you've got with a dot member accessor followed by the actual piece of what's inside of it, the, the, the member field inside there, in this case the name. Now, you'll also have noticed I passed by reference because these act like regular variables. If you don't pass by reference, you're passing by value and all you get is a copy. And any change you make here does not persist. So this gives us the ability to load a student and print a student just by showing you the, the way we can pass and use. Pass by value, pass by reference. Now, where the power of this really comes in is not only can you have complex data types, you can actually come down here and create arrays of these things. So I now have student students see the plural that means I have an array of whatever size in this case five students and I'm going to load my students this works just like every other array if you come down to my load students method that sits here you can see I pass in the studs and I pass in the the size of the array and I create a little loop that loads it with Bob Smith in this case I loaded it with Bob Smith jr you could, of course, load from user input, load from file, what, however you want to get it in there, you could do it. And then here's the student's ID, all based upon the index of I, just like an array. There's nothing really special here. The only difference is you get to create the data type. And then here's my print student, so I can show you there's my student I and my student name. So I get my ID and my name. They're all tied by the same index because they're in the same bucket. This is a bucket of students, which is really kind of fun. And I thought maybe you might want to see a little bit more, too. Well, I also decided to say, hey, given the fact that students can now type their stuff into systems and apparently don't know capitalization, we can attempt to do a very rudimentary form of capitalization correction. This goes back to the prior chapter where we talk about strings and C strings and everything else. Hopefully you remember that strings, as they are in the string library, has a whole bunch of functions for us. But you can treat a string as if it is an array of characters and just by putting the indexing symbology that we're used to these square brackets we can work our way through an array piece by piece how does that work well I've got my load students so I'm gonna load my students up I've got my check names which is another function I wrote passing in the students again remember arrays pass by reference automatically so my check students goal is to say okay if you've given me a name I'm gonna check and make sure that the first and first letter in everybody's name is basically capitalized. How do I know there's a difference between the first name and the last name? Well, the one before it is a space. This does not work perfectly. This is a very rudimentary 
checking thing for capitalization, especially when you have things with uh, subscripts and, and, and partial things that don't get capitalized, uh, especially in Spanish cultures and other cultures around the world, we don't see that. But for this pure example right here, we're going to pretend like everybody's got the same thing, that if, it, if, if there's a space, you're separating a first from a middle, from a last, from a prefix, from a postfix, all being separated by spaces, and we're just going to automatically capitalize everything that's there. So if we look, look at our check names, doo -doo, there it is. There's the check names. And you can see this is a real simple thing. I'm going to loop through my array of names. For every name that I've got, I want to check and say, and I know how big they are because I can pull each name out. In this case, they're all the same size, but it doesn't matter. So this would be for this name, however big it is, if it's position zero, go ahead and capitalize it because we don't care whether it's a prefix, a first name, or what. So capitalize that sucker. Otherwise, if the if the space before j minus one, so that tells you that if you're on any other space but the first space, if the space before is a blank, then go ahead and capitalize the one you're on. And this way you end up with a capitalized set of names that works out really well. If you look at my load students, you can see I'm loading it all with lowercase, but if I run it, da -da -da, you can see that there they all are, capital first, capital last, capital junior. I fixed their names. So this is a way of using functional loops to run through data and fix things that you know might possibly be wrong based upon what you see. So this was just a real quick example to show you how structures work. Build it with struct, build it with this piece, load and use in either individual units, pass by reference, pass by value, or passing arrays. There is pretty much everything you need to know at the beginning for structures. The end part to point out is that in the next class, basically, but I'll show a little bit of it here, we can take structures, the next way of doing objects, which is adding all of the information of a thing together, like cats, you know, have fur, what color fur, what name of the cat, breed of the cat, length of the tail. You can keep track of the information about a cat. You can keep track of the information about a car, number of doors, size of engine, maker, color, vehicle identification number. You've now defined the properties of a car. This is the start of object-oriented programming, which, like I said, comes next. So this is just an introductory thing. What we have is a structure is an object. It doesn't quite meet the criteria of a class. Now that we have classes, you should probably be using those in, in later classes, but not this class. We have too many classes. Um, but it's easy to fix. You just turn around and you change this to a class. And now you've created a class student. But there's a catch. There are two keywords you have to know if you're going to play with this at all. The first one is private. And the second one is public. The pieces of a class can be defined as being pu private or public. The same is true for a struct, but by default, a struct, everything is public. By default for a class, everything is private. So if I turn it from a struct to a class, I break all my code here. What I have to do is come into it and say, guess what, all of this stuff here is going to actually be public. So now, if I have a class and I make everything public, success, I win. But part of the reason you do this is, again, later design philosophy. I want to show you certain things that you can use, methods, like the string class had methods that we saw, find, replace, insert. You can find all these methods. You want to make those methods, at least their, their instantiation parameter list, the, 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 what we've got up here in prototypes, you want to make that available to the public so they can use it, maybe without ever showing them how this is done or what's really inside of it. You want to expose the methods and the parameters for it, and that makes it a little bit cleaner for them to go and do what they want to do. Now, as another side note, I'm going to go back to my struct, just for funsies. In your struct, you can actually create, or in your class for that matter, you can create functions. If you have a function with the same name as the structure of the class, these are basically called initializers. Um, they've got class constructors is also their name. And inside this function, every time you make one of these things, you can initialize your class parameters, your structure parameters, your properties. So there you go. So in this 
parameterized set, you can now take a student and I've given it a name and an, and an ID to initialize this thing. So as soon as it gets created, everybody gets the same thing. And just to prove that that's how it works, watch. I will print the students that I just created right after I make them. Just to show. So if I run this, There you go. See? The first five were created with zero and default as soon as they were instantiated. And then I filled them up with my load, my check, and my print. Some of these things you can actually put inside this over here. Some of them you wouldn't want to. But that's just a quick little, little fun freebie thing that you can actually build functions in here. I just happened to show you a constructor. You could actually, if you wanted to, you could put print student here. And if you wanted to, this loop thing that sits down here with the printout, to a print student, I could take this whole thing, drop it right here. I don't need all this beginning stuff because all I really care about is the ID and the name. And that would give me a printout of my student. So instead of having this stuff here, I could actually do it like this. I can call. I can call the method that I just created for a student. I can do the same thing down here. It's going to print exactly the same thing other than the, the, the change. But instead of, again, instead of calling this, I can do print student. And there we go. So that would mean... I don't have to worry about what the format of things are, what's inside of it. If I change things in my student, this will print out the, the thing that I want. So if I run this, hopefully I didn't screw it up. You can see, there you go. It prints out everything that it's got inside there. And I've modified my code to allow me to print students directly from my structure. Ta-da! An introduction to structures, a review briefly of some of the fun stuff in strings that we can play with in terms of how to manipulate whole strings and work your way through. Feel free to pause the video and copy it in and see if you can play with it and have fun. In regards to the game that's coming up, the a lot of the stuff could be built around this structure thing. Items, uh, enemies, the user, all the things you want to keep track of can be built inside a structure and then passed around. And if you look, our functions only take one thing because it gets everything that's inside there. Even if we came in inside here and did this, and just added one more thing, this still passes everything that sits inside here. Anyway, hope you have a great day. Enjoy the coding.